The last time to get, the last time we were together, we started a new series in our Treasures from the Bible series, and this new series is in the book of Job. And in our introductory installment, we looked at the general overview of the book of Job. We explored the title, the audience, the author, and the background of the book of Job. We also looked at the major theme of the book of Job, and we challenged, and we looked at the challenges uh, that the book of Job posed to believers in this day and age. The challenge of suffering. People trying to understand the meaning of pain. Why good people suffer. Difficult things, I know, and the evil ones uh, appear to be getting, or appear to be riding life without any kind of stress. So we looked at the challenges that the book of Job poses to his people, to, to the people of God. And so if you have your Bibles today, we are going to be studying, we are going to be digging deep into the book of Job today. And today we'll be studying the first two chapters of the book of Job. So if you have your Bibles, let's open to the book of Job. We'll start reading from chapter 1. And the first thing that I want you to notice in the first five verses of chapter 1 is the picture of a blessed life. The picture of a blessed life. So reading from Job chapter 1, from verse 1, the Bible says, There was a man in the land of Oz whose name was Job, and the man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 7, sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yokes of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And his sons will go and feast in their houses. Each one on his appointed day, and will send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was, when the day of feasting had run their course, that Job will send and sanctify them, and they will raise er and they will rise early in the morning and offer burnt offering according to the numbers of them. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Here we see in the very first verse of the first, first, five, first uh, five verses of the book of Job, here we see the Bible painting a picture of Job. Like Abraham, we see that Job was not only a righteous man, he was a blessed man. A man, the Bible told us he had 10 children. He had 10,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 yokes of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very, very large household. In other words, the man was rich and prosperous. And in the age where the law was not been given, when people were not inclined to serving God, this man Job not only worshipped God, but he, you know, he did it regularly on himself, on his own behalf, and on behalf of his own household. He will call, he will bring his children and intercede for them in the presence of the Lord. By the time you go to verse 6 to verse number 12, we see a life-changing encounter that took place in the heavenlies concerning the life of Job. A life-changing, a life, you know, a life-changing encounter, a life-changing exchange between the Lord and the Satan. If you read from verse number 6, reading from verse number 6, the Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also among them. And, say, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, from whence, from where did you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and from the earth, on the earth and from walking back and forth on, uh, on it. Then the Lord said to jo uh, Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth? A blameless and upright man, one who feared God and shunned evil. Here the Lord was seen uh, having counsel with all his, uh, with, uh, well, with all the sons of God. And some have interpreted the sons of God to mean uh, the angels of the Almighty God. But the, amidst these angels, I mean the gathering of these angels, was this particular unique angel called Satan, which is interpreted, which is mean the adversary. And he was present in that particular gathering. And you will notice that the Lord Almighty called the attention of this particular angel, which is called Satan. He called him and said, have you considered my servant Job. Yeah, have you, you know, and God began to extol the virtues of Job, began to tell Joe Satan how wonderful this man is. Upright, righteous, eschewed evil. He hated evil and he was a devoted man. And you will see in verse number nine, the Bible tells us the response of Satan to the Almighty God. Reading from verse number nine, the Bible says, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you may not made hedge? May have you not made a hedge around him? 
around his household and around all that he had on has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands. His possession have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hands and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Here the Lord Almighty will see. That after the Lord called the attention of Satan to uh, call, uh, call the attention of Satan to the life of Job, you will notice that Satan did not argue with the piety of Job. Je Satan did not argue with the Lord. He did not dispute the fact that, uh, that Job was a righteous man. But you will notice in Eshmo, Satan now questioned the motive behind Job's piety. Satan questioned the motive behind the worship and the, and the holy life that Job was living. In other words, Job, Satan was saying, Job is righteous and pious for a reason. He's saying, Job is not righteous because he loved the Lord. That's what he's saying. He's saying he's not serving you because he loves you. Satan is saying that Job is righteous because Job was getting something in return. And to support his position, Satan went and made the argument. He said that, why will Job not be faithful to God when God is protecting and providing for him? He said, why will God, not, why will Job not be faithful to the Almighty God? Because God has made a hedge of protection around him so that nothing can touch him. He said, if I were in Job's shoe, I would do the same thing. I am getting something in result, I, in return. As a result, I have no, re, I have no, uh, there's no other reason for me but to serve you because I'm being blessed as a result of serving you. That's basically what Job, what uh, Satan is saying. Satan is, Satan's argument is that Job is not sincere in his love to the Almighty God. Job is not, a, it's not a righteous man that you think. There is a reason why he's doing what he's doing. He's getting something for it. That's why he's pious. If you take away that thing that he's getting, he will no longer be, he will no longer be, uh, serve you. He will no longer be devoted to you. That is Job's, that is uh, Satan's argument. He's basically saying Job is only pretending to love God because of the things that Job is getting. That is the Satan's argument. And so beginning from verse number 12, we see the catastrophic loss. That Job had to suffer because the Lord was trying to tell Satan that, hey, this guy is not just, is not just serving me because he loves, because of the things that I'm giving to him. He's serving me because he loves me. Let's start reading from verse number 12. And so the Lord said unto Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on him, on the, on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And his messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. Then the, the Sebans uh, uh, raiders uh, raided them and took away and took them away. Indeed, they have killed all they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Verse number 16. While he was still speaking. Another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the, uh, and the servants. And the sheep and the servant and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans from three bands, the three, from three bands raided the camel and took them away. Yes, they killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, Another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people and they are all dead. And I alone came and tell you. Interesting how Satan made sure only one person was left to tell the story. But that's a story for another day. Here you see a string of calamities. Befalling Job in a single, in a very short period of time. Satan got the green light from the Almighty God that, yeah, touch him, touch his property, but don't touch his person. And all of a sudden, the man, the, the Satan unleashed a, the worst kind of calamity a person can imagine. All his children died in one day. Everything that he had was lost. His possession, his blessings, his farm, all the possession that he had, everything won. And you will notice the timing of the incident. And while Satan strategically left one person to be alive to tell the story and to let Job know that this is happening to them. 
But one interesting thing that I want you to notice in this particular chapter, if you read from verse number 20, from verse number 20, the Bible tells us, when all these incidents were being reported unto Job, and Job was absorbing the, the unfortunate news that were coming to him, in verse number 20, the Bible says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and fell to the ground, and did what? And worshipped. You were just been told that 10 of your children died the same day. The man fell down and worshipped. You were told that you've lost all your camel, all your donkeys, all your yoke of oxen, everything that you had, even your servants. The Bible says the man fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came to this book, I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord had taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all these, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. In other words, in the midst of his calamity, in the midst of all the challenges that befell him suddenly, you see the attitude with which this man responded. You see the behavior, you see the mindset. His mindset was, hey, the Lord is the one that gave everything, the Lord takes it away. Even though we know, because we are previewed to see the background story, that the Lord was not the one that took it away. It was Satan who was in operation. But Job's position was that the Lord gave this me the blessing, the Lord took it away, there is nothing I can do about it. And then he worshipped the almighty God. And in the process, he was not even blaming the Lord. He was just saying, well, I bless the name of the Lord. And the Bible says, in all these, Job did not charge God, did not accuse God of being unfaithful. By the time you get to chapter 2 of the book of Job, you will notice that the sons of God gathered again in the opening verses. And Satan was also present. And the Lord Almighty now revisited the, the issue of Job. If you start reading from verse number 3, then the Bible says, that Then the Lord said unto Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and a righteous man, one who feared God and shunned evil, and still, and still, holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without curse. In other words, the Lord was saying to Satan, as much as you wanted to prove to me that Job's love for me is not genuine, as long as you wanted me to agree with you that Job had an agenda for serving me, you have tested him, you have taken away his children, you have taken away all that belong unto him, yet this man still remained faithful. He still maintained his integrity. He has not cursed me to my face just like you claimed he was going to do. And look at the response of this thing that is called Satan. Look at verse number 4. The Bible tells us that Satan now responded to the Almighty God. He says, Satan answered the Lord and said, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has given, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out, stretch out your hands now and touch his bone and his flesh and it will surely curse you to your face. In other words, Satan is arguing. What I did was not enough. It's not enough to make him renounce you. It's not enough to make him fear, to make him deny you. I only touched his possession. I only killed his children. That is not deep enough. He said, if you really want to know what is in the heart of this man, touch his flesh, touch his bones. Make him suffer. Then he's going to go ahead and do what? And cost you to your faith. And the Lord God Almighty did what? The Lord Almighty kind of, uh, okay, say, Let, okay, let's play along. Let's do this thing. Go ahead. Touch his body, but you are not going to kill him. And so, you know, so God allowed him to do it and God played along and so says that afflicted Job with painful boil such that the pain and the suffering that Job endured caused his wife to even tell Job, my friend, this pain is too much. In verse number nine, the wife said, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. In other words, this pain is too much. You lost your children. You lost your business. You lost your household. You lost all your belongings. And now you are sick. Sitting on a dunghill. Scratching your body because of the pain that the boil is bringing. You say, do you want to continue? So why don't you just end it all? That was what the wife was saying. And Job responded to that point. To the wife he said, can we enjoy good from evil from God and not even be able to endure evil? In other words, you are talking like one of those foolish people. We should be able to enjoy what God brings, whatever situation comes in life. So not only that the pain and suffering of Job was endured and was known by all, his friends heard about the pain and they came. And when they saw Job, they saw the pathetic state in which Job was. They sat with him for seven days and could not say a word to him. They were so pained that they could not express any word. And they just mourned with him. And that was what, that's what you see. 
the high level overview of the first two chapters, a description of how a man came from being the greatest in the east to a man sitting on a dung hill, scratching his body because of the affliction and the pain that he cannot explain. He doesn't know where he came from. He doesn't know how he got to where he got to. He just knew that his fortune turned overnight. Now, as indicated in our very first study, we all know that this particular story of Job is a very popular story. If you have spent a day in church at one point in time, you would have heard about the story of Job. We all knew about the suffering of Job. And we also know the question that it raises in the mind of so many people. What is the essence of this pain? Why should you allow somebody to go through that? Is it just that God wants to just show, show the devil that yes, I, I am right and you are wrong? Is that the whole point? Why do you, why, why Job will be subjected to that kind of pain? Is that it? There's a lot of questions that the book of Job raises. In this study, I wanted us to take a different look at this particular story, at this particular story. Many of you have heard the story of how, you know, you have heard a lot of analysis about the pain, the reason for pain and all these other things, but I wanted us to take a different perspective. I want us to look at the story by examining one question that Satan asked the Lord. Okay? And reading from verse number 8, that question, you'll find it in verse number 8 to 10. Reading from verse number 8, the Bible tells us, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who feared God and shuns evil. Now look at verse number 9. So Satan answered and the, answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? Have you not blessed the work of his, of, of his hands? And his possession have you increased in the land? But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will curse you to your face. In other words, here the Lord was calling, like I said earlier, Lord was calling Satan's attention to Job and said, look at this one of my people. This guy is different. This guy is special. But I want you to notice the response of, of Satan. Satan said in verse number nine, he said, does God fear, does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, there is a reason why Job is righteous. There's a reason why Job is worshiping you. There's a reason why God, Job is, is serving you. According to Satan, the reason Job loves and worships the Lord is because of what Job is getting. It is because of the protection and the provision that the Lord has given to him. Satan now threw a challenge to the Lord. He said, I say to you, if you take away all these things, Job will no longer follow you. If you take away his protection, his provision, his preservation, take all those things away and Job will no longer serve you. It is very, very interesting take, especially in our current environment, where the level of our spirituality is equated with the level of our prosperity. In our current Christian environment, our service to God is viewed in terms of return on investment. Which means the more prosperous you are is a function of your spirituality. Because, you you know, be, you, you, make the argument that a lot of people give is that when you serve God, God, you know, you become prosperous. You will never have any kind of problem. You will never have any kind of issue. And so, for the, the, so the more God blesses you, the more you serve him. That is the understanding. That is the current mindset in our, in our, in the Christian environment. Our service to God is viewed as a form of quid pro quo. In other words, I do something for God. God does something back for me. That seems to be the mantra. And it seems to align with Satan's argument. Because Satan's argument is that Job is not serving you because he loves you. He's serving you because of what he's getting. And the mantra in the, in the Christian environment right now is that you serve God and God blesses you. Which means you, there has to be something that you get from serving the Lord. Nobody now, be, no, there is no expansion of the word of God that says people serve God because they love him anymore. We're talking about what we get from God, the prosperity, the abundance, the health, the wealth, and all the other things that has been propagated. Why would anyone serve God if there is no return on their investment? That is the question that we find in the church today. According to Satan, there's only one reason why people worship God. And that reason is because of the blessings that we receive from the Almighty God. And the Lord was telling, Job, he was telling the, uh, Satan that Job is not like that. Job is not serving me because of what he's getting from me. Job is serving me because of me. He's serving me because he loves me. Okay? And so if you step back for a second and imagine if we are the subject of what the Lord Jesus, of what the Almighty God was saying to, to Satan. If you read verse number 8 again, 
If you open your Bible and read from verse number 8 again. Let's read verse number 8 and now substitute the name of Joseph, the name of Job with our own name. Okay, let it read. He said, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Godwin? That there is none like him on the earth. A blameless and an upright man. One who fears God and shuns evil. Now imagine Satan's response. And then ask the Lord. In verse number 9. So Satan answered and said to the Lord. Does God will fear God for nothing? What do you think the answer will be? What do I think the answer will be? The first question is. Can God say, can God say about us what he said about, you know, about Job? Can God point us out as an example of faithful believers in the council of the, in the council of the saints above? Let's now assume that God will even actually vow for us and say that we are righteous and we are holy. When Satan asks the question, does God win put the fear God for nothing? In other words, why do I love the Lord? Why do you think this person that you are pointing out as a, as a model example of a believer? Do you, why do you think he loves you? If you ask ourselves the question, why do we love the Lord? Why are we serving him? Why are we in church? Why do we pray? Why do we do the things that we do in the name of the Lord? Why? If Satan were to go to the next step and take away all that God has blessed us with, can we respond the same way that Job responded? These are difficult questions that we need to sit down and ask ourselves because it goes to the heart of our walk with the Almighty God. And the question for, you know, this question forces us to turn the searchlight upon ourselves. When we say we love the Lord, do we truly love Him? It forces us to evaluate our motive. What is the reason for us being in church? What is the reason of our service to the Lord? What is the reason of our sacrifice to the Lord? What is the reason to our giving to the Lord? Why are we doing what we're doing? The question that Satan asks, does Job, does God will serve, fear the Lord for nothing? That question forces us to reorder our priorities. Why are we doing what we're doing? What is more important to us? Is it the blessing of the Lord or the giver of the blessing himself? Which one is more important to us? The question of Satan forces us to ask ourselves the hard questions. What if I lose everything today? Will I still be able to serve the Lord? What if I don't have what I have today? Will I still be able to serve the Lord? What if my health deteriorates? Will I still be able to serve the Lord? What if I lose my job today? Will I still be able to serve the Lord? What if all these things that I'm enjoying today, they are no longer there? Will I still have the same level of, uh, the same level of interest in the things of God? Because when it happened to Job, Job still maintained his integrity with the Almighty God. If I am tried in the crucible of life today, will I still be able to serve the Lord? That is what the question of, that is what the question of Satan is getting to. The people that call themselves the Almighty God, why are they walking with you? Are you telling me that all of them love you to the point that they are willing to give it up? If you put them to the test, will they be able to come out like Job? And the question is, if Satan were to come for us the way he came for Job, how will we survive? How are we going to go through the challenges that the hell will throw at us and survive if we are, you know, if we don't know how to answer that question? And my brothers and sisters, this very evening, for us to be able to survive, just like Job survived, when Job faced the onslaught of hell, there are basic things that we need to know. Three things that I want to suggest to you that you need to know. Number one is that we need to know who we believe. For you to be able to survive what Job survived and be able to face and to remain standing even with all the pain and the loss that this man suffered in a very short period of time, we need to know what we believe. The Bible tells in the book of Daniel chapter 2, 11 verse 32, it says that those who know their God, they shall be strong and they will do exploits. If you read that verse in reverse, it simply means that those who do not know their God, they will be weak and they will become what? Exploited. So if you don't know the God that you are serving, if you don't know why you are serving the Lord that you are serving, if you don't know the nature, the character, the person of the Lord that you are serving, you are not going to be strong. You are going to be weak because you are going to be moved. You are going to be shifted up and down. And then you become exploited by the situations of life. And so the Bible tells us, the people who do know their God, they shall be strong and they shall carry out great exploits. So for us to be able to survive the onslaught of hell, just like Job did, we first of all need to know the God. 
that we're serving. Number two, how do you survive? The kind of terrible, cha the challenges that Job survived. How are you able to survive it if it happens to you? Look at verse number eight. The, the second thing you need to know is that you must know why you believe the Lord. Why do you believe him? It's not just knowing God now. The question is, why do you believe him? But when people are about to get married, we ask them the question, why do you do, why are you getting married to this person? Some will say it's because he's beautiful. Okay, good. She's 20 something. She has to be beautiful. Everything is still in place. By the time she turns 50 or turns 60 and things start fagging and you see that both of us cannot hold it any longer. Are you still going to fall in love with that same person? So if it's just for the physical beauty, you might probably be mistaken. The question is, why do we love the Lord? Is it because we have been blessed today? Is it because we have good health today? Is it because we have friends? Is it because the Lord is answering our prayer? What happens if the Lord doesn't answer your prayer? Are you still going to love him? What happens if he doesn't meet you at the point of your need? Are you still going to love him? What happens if your, if your strength is failing or your health is failing or you are in the hospital or loved ones or you miss or you lose, you lose your loved one? What happens if tragedy of life strikes? Are you still going to love the Lord the way you're supposed to love him? So the question is, for us to be able to survive, the onslaught of hell, just like Job survived, number one, you need to know the God that you are serving. Number two, you need to know why you are serving him. Am I serving him because of what I am eating or what I hope to get from him? The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4, if you read from verse number 16, it said that we love him because he first loved us. That's why we love him. He died for us. That's why we are willing to do what? Our, our, our worship of him is an expression of gratitude to the things that he has done for us. So you must know why you are serving the Lord. There's nothing wrong in receiving the blessings of the Lord. There's nothing wrong in receiving the protection of the Almighty God. But if that is the motivation for serving Him, you are missing it. Because once those things are taken away, what happens? Are you still going to be able to stand? Will you still be able to continue to love Him? Number three, how do you survive the onslaught of hell when it comes, just like it came into the life of Job? Number one, like I said, you have to know who you believe. Number two, you have to know why you believe. Number three, you have to be convinced and persuaded of what you believe about that particular God. What do you believe about God? And are you persuaded by it? The Bible makes us to understand, if you read the book of Romans chapter 4, when Abraham was waiting for the promised child, the Bible said that being persuaded, that he that, is prom that he that has promised is able to do it, then he was willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. Job himself said in Job chapter 19, if you read from verse number 25, Job said, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And he will stand at the last on earth. And after my skin is destroyed, uh, and this I know that my flesh, that in my flesh I will see God. Whom I shall I, whom shall see, whom, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold not another. How my heart yearn within me. In other words, there's a persuasion in my spirit that this God, I am going to see him. That this God, and even if this Satan destroys this flesh, I am still going to see him. In other words, Job is already talking about the resurrection, even while he was still in the Old Testament. That is the conviction that this man has about the God that he believes. That is what he believes. That is what he's persuaded about. The question is, what are you persuaded about the God that you are serving? What are you convinced that God can do in your life? The circumstance and the situation that surround you, are you convinced that God has the power to be able to overcome all those things? Because if you are not persuaded, if you are not convinced, if we don't know the God that we're serving, if you don't know why we are serving that God, and we are not persuaded about the personality or the character of the God that we're serving, we will not be able to survive the onslaught of hell that is sure to go through the life of every one of his children. The question then is, how do you, how do you know who and why you believe? How do you develop the conviction to be able to trust the almighty God and trust his character that Lord Almighty will never leave you hanging? How do you do that? Number one, you do it through an encounter. You cannot walk with the Lord. You cannot know the character of the almighty God. You cannot have a relationship with the almighty God without an encounter. The Lord Almighty must have a visitation with you. 
You must come to the point where you meet with the Lord. The Bible says of a man called Saul, who was who, or Paul the apostle who was formerly called Saul. He was a persecutor of the believer. A man who never believed in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Never believed in the Messiahship. But there was one day he had an encounter with the Almighty God. And the one that, was, that made a career of destroying the church became the one who was building up the church. That transformation only happens through an encounter. And regardless of what anybody tells Paul the Apostle, he knew who he met. He knew the transformation that took place in his life. And so he was ready to give his life. Even when Satan decided to trouble him, the Paul the Apostle remained steadfast. The only way we can continue to remain, to know who we are serving and to be convinced of his personality is to have a true encounter with the Almighty God. Number two, how do you develop this particular knowledge of the Lord, faith in the Almighty God, a deep conviction of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ so that you can survive the onslaught of hell? How do you do it? You do it through engagement. You do it through engagement. And by engagement, it means when the word of God tells you something, you put that word to practice. The more you engage the word of God through practice, the more you engage the word of God through obedience, the more you engage the word of God through actual involvement with the things, the requirement of the word of God, the more the Lord Almighty comes through for you. Peter can only hear or talk about the idea of somebody walking on water. But the day he engaged the word of God, when the Lord Jesus Christ said, come, and Peter stepped out of the boat, Peter engaged the word of God and started walking on water. At that point in time, the theory of the word of God changed to reality in his life. Until you obey the word of God, anything you hear about the word of God is just a theory. Until you begin to practice it in your life, until you begin to engage the word of God, the glory of the word of God is never seen. And so for us to develop the conviction, to us to know the God that we're serving, that will help us to overcome the challenges of life. Number one, you have to encounter that word. Number two, you have to engage that word. Number three, you have to commune with that word. Communion through prayer. Communion through fellowship. Communion through da daily encounter. Look at the life of Job. The Bible says that Job takes the time on a regular basis to talk, to worship, and to make sacrifice to the Almighty God. He was communing with God regularly. And so he understood the voice of God. He understood the character of God. He understood what God liked and what God did not like. He knew what he was going to do to continue to enjoy the favor of the Almighty God. We will not be able to survive the onslaught of hell that is sure to come upon the world if we do not have an encounter with the Lord. We cannot survive the challenge that the enemy will put out, will bring our, will bring our way if we are not engaging the Lord in His Word. We will not be able to survive if we do not commune, have a regular communion with the Almighty God. And so the question this evening as we close is how do you encounter him? Do you have an encounter with him? Sorry. Do you engage with him daily on a daily basis? Do you have communion with him on a daily basis? Because if those things are not in place, if there is no encounter, no engagement, no communion, you will find out that when the enemy comes, many of us will not be able to stand. And that's why the book of Daniel says that those who know their God, they shall be strong and they will do exploits. And I pray that will be our testimony in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.